All right, let's go ahead and get started. It's 12.15. We want to stay on schedule. I know, uh, I know our lunch conversations are always awesome, so they are hard to stop. But let's go ahead and get our program started. As I said, it's a full house, it's a full program, jam-packed, so we will keep it moving. First, what I want to do is to go ahead and at least recognize those guests. We won't be calling out any, anybody uh, in particular, but I would like to, uh, let's, go ahead, let's, go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so first, I just want to welcome our guests today. We won't uh, call anyone by name, but if we could just have our guests with us today, let's just stand up and recognize with applause. And if you, as so very happens, as so very happens when our guests, many of you will recognize somebody from across the room, and now you get a chance after, after our program to uh, go up and say hello. Uh, I want to just say also, we've got a couple of announcements before we get in. This just in. Uh, our club was recognized at the district conference, which was this weekend, and we, I know uh, Bob Hope went, Bob brought this to me, and Clark Dean was there, and I know they're both here today, um, and uh, I think we had one or two others attend as well, so uh, nice to be represented there, but in our award, the district recognized for the largest category, category four, uh, our club for the largest support for Rotary International Foundation. So uh, great leadership by our club, that's important to our club, so thank you all. And the district thanks us. Also want to remind you before, so you don't forget, you've got the QR code on your table. I forgot to do it. I hope I remember when I sit down, uh, get uh, a credit for attendance today. All right, I want to bring two slides up now. One is going to be uh, looking past, and the other one's going to be looking forward. Uh, so the first slide is going to be just recognizing those Rotarians who came out in honor of annual service day, which was last Monday. Uh, I love some of these photos, by the way. So uh, I, I ended up being called away for business last minute and could not go, and it was the first time in many years. It's such a special, great day uh, to serve the community, have fellowship together. That's some of the most special stuff. I, I remember seeing a picture of uh, John Yates reading to a classroom, and uh, really, really special. So you can see some of the pictures there. We had great turnout, uh, very proud of our club there. I want to thank, in particular, the YMCA Early Learning Centers, uh, which we partnered with, and also the Ch Children's Museum for hosting our volunteers. So just round of applause to us for that service day. And then the second slide is just looking a, uh, two weeks from today. We've got our annual spring cocktail party. So you've got the QR, QR code. If you haven't uh, RSVP'd yet, please go ahead and do so. I think there's a, a, a modest uh, additional fee just to be able to go to cover some of the costs. Uh, but this is our annual spring cocktail party. If you remember, I think last year was a botanical garden. It was awesome. We do a great job turning out for this. This is that special social time where we just get to visit with each other uh, outside of a round table, outside of boardrooms, um, and just joy each other, particularly if the weather's good. So if, as a reminder, it's going to be at the new Sifley Piazza at the Woodruff Art Center. Uh, we'll have some youth performances, of course, food and beverages. Please join us if you haven't signed up already. It will be well worth it. Okay, so that's uh, the official announcements. Now we have a new member introduction, so I'm going to welcome our new member, Chad Parker, and he's being introduced today. So let's, um, I think his sponsors are here. We've got Lauren Kuntz, co-sponsor, Julia Houston, co-sponsor, and Dan Gordon. Uh, I'm not sure who's taking the lead at the podium. Lauren, okay, Lauren, you are tapped to introduce. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so excited to introduce Chad. I wasn't aware I was doing it until as we were walking up. So I'm going to be reading from the um, bio that's up that you can see as well. Um, a lot of you know Chad. He is um, the CEO, president and CEO of the East Lake Golf Club, which, of course, is golf with a purpose. And they do so much great work in the community, not only through the Tour Championship, but in their partnerships with Drew Charter and the East Lake YMCA and so many other great organizations. Um, so a little bit about Chad, obviously has hosted the PGA Tours season finale, the Tour Championship, 22 times since 1998. Has um, raised almost $50 million for charities, specifically in the East Lake community. I love this, created a charity golf event, the Healing Place Charity Championship in his hometown of Florence, Alabama. 
Um, currently a trustee on the Board of Leadership Atlanta and Vice Chair of PGA REACH Georgia Board. Um, serves in an advisory role for the Mississippi State PGA Alumni Board and the Giving Kitchen, among other um, previous uh, roles he's had. Um, basically, he's always been at the Eastlake Golf Club, right out of college, has been there his entire career and risen up to the president role. Um, this is one of my favorite things, and I know this firsthand because uh, Chad will bring out his enormous smoker. Is that what we call it? What would we call it? Smoker? He brings out this enormous barbecue smoker to all of these events and volunteers his time and makes amazing food. So hopefully we'll find a way to put that to work here at Atlanta Rotary. <laughs> Gonna go ahead and put you on the spot for that one, Chad. Um, but uh, Chad is truly a community servant. Um, Julia and I both had the pleasure of being in the same Leadership Atlanta class with Chad, and you will not find someone more committed to the community, more willing to roll up their sleeves and come alongside to do the good work. I am so excited to announce that Chad is our newest member of Atlanta Rotary. Well, Chad, before you leave the stage, I just want to, I have your pen here, uh, which we wear with pride. I think we also have a, a desk a example of the four-way test, which we'll get to you. Um, but you join uh, a worldwide organization of 1.4 million members worldwide, uh, 46,000 clubs. Our club is the fourth largest, and we say the most special. So, uh, Chad, welcome. And Lauren, live in the spirit of say yes when called upon by Rotary. She's coming up on stage and on the stairs said, yes, I'll introduce Chad. <laughs> so, thank, uh, you know, all new members, we always tell, always say yes. And there you go. Uh, all right. At this point, we, uh, we get a great update. So, Randall, uh, I'll call Randall Kirsch up to the stage. He's co-chair of our early learning initiative, which most of you have heard about. Uh, he's going to come up and give us an update on this strategic initiative. Uh, take it away, Randall. Thank you. Awesome. And Joel, if I could get the slides up, that'd be great. Um, hey guys, just thank you for listening for like the next three or four minutes just to give you a quick update on our early education initiative. And I'm up here um, representing a whole task force of people, it includes my co-chair, Shan Cooper, um, representatives from Gears and the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, our nonprofit partners. And, and Lauren, I was going to ask her to come up and actually give this update, but she uh, or has already had an extemporaneous speaking opportunity today, so we won't make her do that. Um, so yeah, representing a large group, just to kind of level set with what we're doing again, for those of you who haven't paid close attention up to this point, is we're really taking part in a $20 million public-private initiative that's led by the mayor's office um, and involves a lot of these organizations that are working in the early ed space, um, led by PACT, sort of a coalition around this whole idea. And our unique position in this, there's a lot of pillars to the project, and ours is going to be around workforce incentives, trying to keep more teachers in the classroom with our earliest learners, and also applying sort of best teaching practices on the road to literacy. So you want to look at a quick reminder of what exactly we're doing. We're giving teachers in about 250 licensed early care centers in the city of Atlanta a chance to earn up to a thousand extra dollars of pay if they do one of two things or both. Um, one of them is $500 just to stay in the classroom. So if, if they're still there in the same program a year after we launch or they hit their one year anniversary in the 24 or 25 part of our program, they'll earn $500. The other one is um, another $500, and also the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy has been working with the mayor's office to generate this mayor's award that'll sweeten this one a little bit, for them to train in proven literacy and, and reading uh, teaching methods so that they're not only staying in the classroom and creating stability, but actually putting our kids on a better path to literacy earlier, which is ultimately the better path to self-determination for the rest of their lives. And so in addition to that, which are kind of the hard incentives, this is a very underpaid but and also under-recognized population. So we're going to have annual recognition lunches for teachers who enrolled in this and earning these um, rewards. And I'll tell you, just having done, uh, read to kids in the classroom over at the Woodson Park Y last week, and I'm sitting there with those teachers who were wonderful, by the way, and thinking, if these are the folks we're helping, we're, we're in the right place. It just, it, it really reinforced what we're doing and why. Um, some real good progress on infrastructure. This thing goes nowhere if we can't pull this first one off. So we've got a fulfillment partner. They're called Care Solutions Incorporated. They've done a lot of similar work for the Department of Early Care and Learning, DECAL, 
um, with the power payments program. So they've got some replicable uh, infrastructure and knowledge, and they handle all the monies getting into the teachers' paychecks, all the tax forms, all that stuff that this club does not want to even think about trying to handle. Um, and they're also giving us $50,000 over three years in in-kind uh, hours on the project, which was fantastic because it helped us with our budget. What that means is that we're official. We're going to launch on August 1st. There'll be a two-month enrollment period for teachers in these 250 centers, and that's when the rubber will really hit the road, and we can start uh, giving out these incentives as they uh, stay in the classroom and, and take these courses on Cox campus. Uh, our next immediate priorities are putting together an impact assessment team. Lauren is working on that. We're pulling together several folks. There's a professor at GSU who's going to be involved. Bill Todd has hooked us up with one of his grad students who wants to be involved. But what we're trying to do here is this stuff is hard to measure in terms of impact, right? There's longitudinal elements and, and behavioral elements. So they're going to be thinking about what does that methodology look like and how do we assess whether this thing is working, both short and long term. And then at the same time, we're going to be gearing up our comms committee, you know, to crank out how, A, you know, priorities, get the teachers to know about it and enroll, that's number one, and then B, focusing on public awareness that the Rotary Club is doing this and why it's so important and all those good things. Um, let me tell you how we're doing on fundraising, because I tell you, it's been an awesome story so far, and we still need your help. Those are my headlines there. Um, our total three-year club commitment was just under $1.8 million. Um, a big chunk of that, about 46% of our total three-year need, has been funded by our two charitable foundations. The Rotary Club of Atlanta Charitable Foundation and our Educational Foundation have both made significant three-year commitments that taken together represent 46% of our total. So that's awesome. Um, the club has come alive in terms of uh, uh, individual pledges. What you're going to see on your table, if you have not yet pledged, is the opportunity to do so today in about 30 seconds. We've got an online pledge form. You just scan that QR form and you should be good to go. What we've got is folks in this room and elsewhere have, have pledged $150,000 in terms of three-year commitments, so about $450,000 total there, and then we've gotten over $60,000 in one-time commitments. Now, if you've really been paying attention to these updates, you know that if that Stephanie Blank and Tommy Holder came together and said, if the club can raise $200,000 this year, we'll kick in another hundred. So if you're doing the math, we're over $200,000 in current year commitments, which means we have triggered that. We've got total club commitments up to this point of over $600,000, putting us at 80%. Yeah, big time. 80% of our target for three years, that is an awesome start. If you've ever done fundraising, however, you know that the hardest dollars to raise are the last dollars you raise. So guys, that last 20% is a long last mile, which is where you guys come in. So please, 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 if you have not pledged, join your many, many fellow Rotary members who have and be part of this. We need you. We can't do it without you. Um, and that's our update. So just thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, Randall, thank you for the update. Thank you and Shan for incredible leadership. You know, in new member orientation this morning, we talked about how our club looks for those special projects that pass the but for Rotary test, where if we weren't involved, it might not happen. And, and this is creating a new momentum, a new initiative that aligns with the mayor's office, that aligns with, that aligns with much of the work that uh, many major charities in Atlanta and foundations are working on, but it's bringing something new. So uh, fat, it's, it's, it's a great update, and it's so exciting to see 80% of the way there, but we're not there yet, right, as you say. So we've uh, still got some work to do. All right, before our, our speaker, our, our main speaker comes to us, I do want to bring someone special to the stage. Her name is Adirayo Agilere. She is our uh, Georgia Rotary student, and while she comes up to the stage, I'll say, you know, she joined us last August. She's from Nigeria. I believe this is your first time in the U.S., right? Great, so uh, she is gonna, uh, uh, she completes her freshman year this week, and I think you're gonna be a, a biology and pre-med major, so she'll start that next fall. Her host is Kathy Waller, so Kathy, thank you for um, playing host to Adi Rayo. Uh, so we, we wanted to just invite her to the stage to share some thoughts about her year uh, associated with Rotary and GSU. Hello everyone, um, it was only eight months ago that I was on this stage introducing myself as your GRSP student and today I'm here to say goodbye as your GRSP student. 
So before I do that, I'm going to share with you a glimpse of what my year has looked like with Rotary. Um, so these are my first impressions and things I found different. Um, first of all, leaving your card in a tab, I think, is the highest display of trust I have ever seen anywhere. Um, letting someone else take your card away from you to pay for your meal is dangerous, I think. <laughs> um, also, ice in everything. Every drink has at least 60% ice. I have to actively ask restaurants to give me less ice, and even then, it's still not less enough. Um, also, having cheese as a snack, I've gone to people's homes and they've asked me, Do you, would you like a snack? And I've said yes, and they give me like a platter of cheese, just to eat cheese. Um, <laughs> um, also, southern hospitality is a real thing, I would say, because I found out that so many people here in the south are really willing to go the extra mile for you, whatever you need, which is very which is a refreshing change because in Nigeria, people care about themselves and themselves alone. So it's been nice to kind of have like a community. And lastly, the weather um, has been confusing. It's summer, <laughs> it's summer at 10 a.m. and then it's winter at 10.45. It's <laughs> um, also, I have discovered the greatest American invention since I've been here and it's Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I personally, and other JRSB students have said this as well, that they think Chick-fil-A is God's gift to mankind. <laughs> and it's, it's a shame that we don't have it everywhere. We should have this everywhere. You know, you just wake up and Chick-fil-A at your doorstep. It's <laughs> My year at GSU, um, no, I wasn't supposed to take this picture in the chemistry lab, but here we are. It's been, it's been amazing. I mean, coming from a city in Nigeria with 500,000 people, I thought I was a city girl. And I came here to Atlanta and I realized I was indeed not a city girl because this is the real city. And it's been amazing being in Atlanta and being close to all these major sports, you know, World of Coke, the Aquarium. And Georgia State has been such an amazing international community for me. And I've made so many friends from similar places, from different places. And it's been nice to get like an education and a college experience all in one. And I've, I've basically found my family at Georgia State University. Now onto the Georgia Rotary Student Program. For the guests, this is a program where an international student is sponsored by a Rotary Club. And currently we have 40 plus students from over 20 countries. So I've made so many friends and it's unbelievable how many things I know about so many different places now. So just some of the things JRSP has given me this year. Friends from all over the world. Right now I just have to pay for a plane ticket to almost any continent and I'll have free accommodation, free food. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing how much you can learn from other people from other places just being in one location. And it's just been, it's been great having these friends and I'm sure I'll have them for life and I've made so many strong bonds. And it's just been so nice and amazing being, not being alone as an international student here in Georgia. Also, I've gotten a tour of Georgia through GRSP. I think I've seen more of Georgia than I have seen of Nigeria, which I lived in for 17 years. Um, some of my favorite places are Cumberland Island, Pelham. You might be wondering, what is in Pelham? It's a Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> I think Piggly Wigglies are the most southern thing I have ever seen. <laughs> and it's, it's just, it's amazing. It's like this. This particular one has been there for years and it's still running, despite the fact that there's only 2,000 people living in Pelham. It's, it's amazing. Also, Savannah. Savannah was a beautiful, beautiful city. And Florida, which I just came back from yesterday for the district conference. So GRSP has really taken me to a lot of places in Georgia and outside of Georgia. And I mean, where else would you get a free tour of everywhere and all these places? It's, it's incredible. Now, these are some highlights of my year here. First of all, UGA, go dogs. <laughs> no one tell Brian Blake I said that. Go Panthers. 
Also, World of Coke and the Georgia Aquarium, courtesy of Kathy. She sponsored my friends and I to the World of Coke and the Aquarium. And the picture in the rings we took, and then we got down, and there was a sign that said, please do not step in the rings. So, um, <laughs> too late. <laughs> The holidays I spent with some Rotary members. I spent Thanksgiving with Kathy. I don't have any pictures here because I was too busy stuffing my face. Christmas also with Kathy. Um, New Year with a friend's host family. And Easter with another friend's host family. So Rotarians have really open, opened their homes to me and taken me in during these holidays and I really couldn't ask for more. Day of the Dead, I think, was one of the weirdest, in a good way, things that I have ever been to. It was incredible, just everyone dressed like a dead person. It, it was amazing. And Waffle House, Waffle House was, I went to Waffle House at 2 a.m. on a random Sunday, and it was, as you can see, I had the best time of my life. This was. How has GRSP made me better? Um, first of all, it has made me more adaptable because I've been in so many different social situations, group projects. I mean, the very first day of GRSP, I had to make like a group presentation with 10 people I had never met before and we had an hour. So it's really made me adaptable to certain situations. It's made me more appreciative because this is not an opportunity so many people get. And it's just been incredible to be able to give back in little ways that I can through service projects. And it's, it's been amazing. Knowledge of other cultures. I mean, how else, how, how much better can you get learning other people's cultures directly from those people instead of reading it on the internet? And also taking pictures. I never used to take any pictures, but being in GRSP, you're just sitting down and your random camera is in your face. So you, you have to learn how to take pictures. Um, so it's been an amazing year, an incredible time. And I will be continuing my bachelor's at GSU, so I hope to keep in contact with some, most, all of you. Um, it's, it's been an, an unforgettable year. I have made friends for life. I have had opportunities I could never have dreamt of. And I will forever remember this year in my heart. Right now, it is the best year I've ever had in my life. So thank you for opening your homes and your hearts to me. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs> Adirayo, thank you for sharing those pictures and your, your stories from the year. It just sounds like a great year, and it's why we do this, and we love the association with you. So uh, wonderful. I wanted to share this pen with you. This is one of our club pens. We give it to you, and we hope you wear it with pride and good memory, and always come back and visit us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we're ready for the main featured part of our program. So I will ask Wendell Riley to come up to the stage, introduce our guest speaker, and run the, get David Lewis set up as moderator and run the program. Thank you. Thank you, Cannon. It's the first question in Rotary's four-way test. Is it the truth? And in the spirit of Cannon's reference to iconic characters, it's the first word in Superman's catchphrase, truth, justice, and the American way. Our guest speaker today is one of the good guys, standing up for truth and against disinformation. Sharon Masavi is the president of the International Center for Journalists, ICFJ, an NGO based in Washington, D.C., enabling a worldwide network of 160,000 journalists to provide trustworthy news that is essential to free and strong societies. ICFJ develops and runs some 70 programs around the world helping journalists address the critical issues of the day, innovate to connect with communities, and build news organizations that thrive. ICFJ was founded in 1984 by journalists from the New York Times and Boston Globe with the idea of supporting fellow journalists abroad, especially those in countries with weak or non-existent free press. They believed that the role of journalism is to expose, investigate, and articulate issues of concern to average citizens and endeavor to spread these ideals across the globe. The world looks different today. 
But the central role of a free press in functional democracies re remain the same. While Sharon is only in her second year as president of ICFJ, she's been with the organization for over 15 years, leading new project development, innovation, and impact. She has designed programs to support newsroom transformation, create investigative networks, and mentor emerging media leaders. She also spearheaded the creation of ICFJ's research arm. Prior to ICFJ, Sharon worked as communications manager with the Knight Foundation, and for, for more than a decade before that, she was based in New Delhi, Jerusalem, and Tokyo, reporting from countries across Asia and the Middle East for Bloomberg, Business Week, and the New Republic, among others. The villains of disinformation around the world today have met their match. At this time, I would like to invite Sharon up to the stage with our own superhero needing no introduction, David Lewis, who will serve as moderator. Please give our distinguished panelists a warm rotary welcome. Disinformation is something that we apparently uh, hear about uh, more and more. There seems like there's a headline every day. Just a couple of examples. Uh, yesterday's Atlanta Journal-Constitution had an article about how Brad Raffensperger, our Secretary of State, that his biggest fear about elections wasn't voter fraud, it wasn't machines, it was politicians lying about results. That was his biggest fear. None of the other things that we hear about. Uh, Washington Post had a piece today about how Twitter under Elon Musk's new management has relaxed its rules, which has allowed Russia and Chinese propaganda efforts and disinformation efforts to explode. Uh, and then the New York Times has an article this morning about uh, how the guy known as the godfather of AI recently quit Google because of his fears over how the technology that he helped create threatened all of us. Um, but let's talk about what's really important. What's the scoop on Don Lemon and Tucker Carlson? <laughs> and Dominion Voting Systems and Fox News? And how, and how do they relate to disinformation? They, they do relate, sadly, to disinformation. The uh, Tucker Carlson leaving Fox News, obviously. Oh, am I not off? Mm. It's on. It is. Just hold it close. Just hold it close. Okay, usually my daughter usually complains I'm way too loud, so apparently. <laughs> uh, so what happened with Tucker Carlson leaving, obviously, is very directly related to the disinformation ecosystem that we're living in right now. This came after the settlement with Dominion Voting Systems, and while it was not directly related to the settlement, Dominion has not said this was not a requirement of the settlement. What happened, what Fox discovered was that lies are costly, and they basically made the calculation, and again, there's all kinds of reasons for, for why Tucker might have been let go, but the Dominion Voting Settlement very clearly was evidence that there is a line too far in in, 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 in libel suits, in libel law across the US, you have to have the intent for malice, right? That is why most libel suits do not go forward because it's an quote unquote honest mistake. And what was exposed was that the hosts of, of the Fox, including Tucker Carlson, were saying one thing, not believing, not believing what they were putting on the air and that exposed them to, to the intent and the malice charge. All right, just a, a definition. What's the difference between disinformation and misinformation? It's a great question. Disinformation is the intentional spread of false information. This is what you see coming out of uh, state actors. Uh, Russia, China, and Iran are the, the biggest uh, state perpetrators of disinformation campaigns. India and Nigeria uh, are coming up fast. So that is often where disinformation it also, you can do it also, it's not just political actors, it can be uh, folks doing it just for the money, and we can talk about that more in a minute. Misinformation is something that I would venture to say everyone in this, infor in this room has participated in, myself included. Misinformation is the unintentional spread of false information. Often it comes from disinformation campaigns that are spreading and you see something and, and share it, not realizing it, but that is the unintentional uh, act of spreading false information. Okay, you know, big picture. 
How worried should we be about the threat of disinformation? Extremely. <laughs> uh, I mean, disinformation is not a new phenomenon. We've had propaganda as long as human beings have been alive. What has changed is the ability to amplify and spread it at lightning speed. And AI, in particular generative AI, the ability to create content, pictures, stories, etc., speeds that up infinitely. And where disinformation, I think, is, is, is it affects every single aspect of our lives. It affects us as citizens. You need good information to make decisions. It affects your life as a citizen, right? We've all seen the, the, the impacts of having disinformation around elections. And businesses, I mean, this is a room full of business folks. You guys rely on, on, on quality information. You wanna know about what's happening with trade with China. You wanna know about your brand. You know, brand sensitivity, for example, or brand, um, uh, you know, your, your reputation. You've, you see all kinds of disinformation spreading about, uh, you know, Amazon. Uh, it can be any company. Eli Lilly, I think it was last year, there was a, a hoax where someone purporting to be Eli Lilly said, oh, free insulin for everybody. It did not go down well for Eli Lilly, needless to say. So there are, the impacts are just literally in every aspect of your life. Um, we have a huge problem here in the U.S., but talk about, ICFJ does so much international work, Talk about how disinformation is impacting countries overseas and, and, and give some examples of the kinds of things that you're seeing. Absolutely. But before I do that, I want to just, one thing I think is important to recognize is that disinformation is probably the biggest global industry. Great import-export business. It is going in and it is coming out. So obviously into the U.S. what we're seeing is massive, massive disinformation uh, in places like, from places like Russia, as I said, China, Iran, all, ki all kinds of places. And then we see us exporting it out, our disinformation gets exported out. In some cases, it gets translated into Spanish, and then it comes back into the U.S. again and goes into our Spanish language communities. I just want to give a shout out to my colleague, Laura Zamer. That's one of the projects that we're supporting is helping uh, fight disinformation in Spanish language communities here in the US. To your point about what we're seeing elsewhere is what happens often is, and a New York Times reporter gave this an, uh, analogy, so I will, I will give credit where credit is due. She said that often what you're seeing with disinformation campaigns is it's the equivalent of, of working in sort of less developed countries without, that, that don't operate in English because things not in English go under the radar. The social media uh, organizations do a much less uh, thorough, you can argue if they're doing a thorough job in English, obviously, but they really are, it really does get ignored. And so a lot of things are tested in countries, in, around elections. India is a great example where things are tested. Uh, again, all parts of Latin America, we're seeing narratives start. And what happens is, 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 as the New York Times reporter said, it's the equivalent of sort of like a car thief you know, trying out you know, strategies to steal a car in a, in a low policed neighborhood. And then, once they get really good at it, they bring it to Beverly Hills. And the developed world is in this metaphor, Beverly Hills. And so there are no borders. There is not, oh, it's happening in this country, it's not happening here. There is a playbook, and it gets played out in literally every country in the world. It, it, it feels like politicians, bloggers, pundits never pay a price for lying, for spreading disinformation. How do you make them pay a price? Fox just paid a rather large, multi-billion price, and I, I, I think a lot of people are wondering if that might be a watershed moment. That is there a price with an actual dollar number attached to it? Is there a price to be paid? That is a, ch that is a challenge. I think what, what news organizations are trying to do, there's a real sense in the journalism community that, that, that we need to build trust and transparency to serve our audiences, but that also we're making the bet that, hey, that's how you make money. People will actually wanna pay for trusted information. And so if you can build those lines of trust, how do, you, how do you sort of make that a business itself? But to your point, yes, this is the problem. You can actually make a buck 
being dishonest, and there are active people aside from political actors, you have troll farms who are not, don't care about politics, but they can make money doing it. There was, if you all remember the Canadian trucker protest, there were troll farms basically setting up false uh, GoFundMe campaigns to raise money for the truckers. It did not go to the truckers. Uh, so there are incentives built into our systems to make money, but again, we need to counter it with efforts to build trust and transparency. Um, you know, your average parent out there, I mean, my kids are all out of the home and on their own now, but for someone with young kids, I mean, I think it must be terrifying to think of, of the kind of information that their kids, like all of us, are being exposed to. Is there a, a role for education about information that, that needs to happen or is happening? There is a huge role there, and it's incredibly important. There are a lot of media literacy efforts, and I would say as, 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 a, as a Rotary Club, if I can make a pitch, and supporting these kinds of efforts in school are really important, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's not about politics. It's about who are your sources, checking your sources. Is this reliable information? But I would also argue is media literacy is not enough for our kids. We all need it too. And how do you inject it into community efforts to make communities more media literate? Journalists are trying to do it. There are a lot of efforts to build better connection and connective tissue between local news outlets and communities, which I think is incredibly important to building that literacy. The other thing I want to add to that is my, my fear less than people believing the wrong thing and our kids being exposed to the wrong information is that we are developing a generation of people who don't believe anything. And that is a lot of what disinformation narratives, especially political ones, try to do. The Russians are stupendous at it. They don't care necessarily what you believe They'll throw at eight, 10 different narratives on the same thing so that you throw up your hands and say, well, I'm not gonna believe anything. I don't know what to believe. And I think when you look at the younger generation, I've got, a, I've got an 18 year old myself who knows damn well to check her sources, but still, you know, you, you just, you, we are raising a generation of people, uh, of kids who don't believe in anything. And I think that is more dangerous than anything. Talk uh, more about AI specifically and the kinds of ways it's being used to generate disinformation. So AI is being used to generate a lot of things. There is, before I get to the horribleness of AI, which we could spend hours and hours talking about, there are benefits to it. And, you know, in journalism, for example, you know, the hope is that we see ways that it can speed up the process so that you have more time to accurately, to really do the deep digging, investigating, and not do the grunt work. So there, it, there are positives to AI. So I just want to just lay that out there before I go down the, the rabbit hole of uh, uh, an Orwellian chaos that we are about to see. Um, <laughs> The, the, the generative AI is, is, is incredibly scary. The area that I think a lot of people are particularly worried about is visual generative AI. The ability to create, I think we've all seen the videos that just came out about Biden and, and Kamala Harris. There was the Pope wearing a puffer jacket a few months ago, my personal favorite. So you see, and, and, and visual information is, is really important because that's what plays on our emotions more than anything. And that's generally what disinformation does really, really well as it plays on our emotions. And we, as human beings, we're much more responsive to emotion than to reason. So, the challenges are going to be en enormous. From the media perspective, journalists are desperately trying to figure out how do we do this. Again, it's not that it's different than what the combating disinformation efforts that have been happening, but now it's gonna, again, be at scale. It's just gonna, literally, in, in three seconds. So that, that is a big fear. There are efforts by uh, companies like Adobe and others, and, and there's a consortium of news outlets to create sort of verification indicators. So you see when something, you know, you, you, you know when something is real and something is not. So it's gonna require a whole new set of muscles that we have to develop as a, as a society that we haven't remotely developed. Um, you know, we all live to a certain degree in our own echo chambers. Um, and you know, in, in that environment, um, 
how do you reach people um, who are in, whether it's you know, QAnon or God knows, you know, there's a million examples, how do you reach people who are trapped inside an echo chamber of disinformation? Couple of answers to that. The first is, and Laura and I were talking about this last night, to go try to reach the extremes on any side, I, I don't think is, is the point. I, I, don't th I think it's a fool's errand to some extent, but there is a giant, giant middle who live in their echo chambers, and we believe, and we, we all have our biases and confirmed biases, and we, we, we respond to those. So that, I think, there's a large, mushy middle, which I think we need to be approaching. That said, the, the best purveyors of information or the, the people we trust the most are people we know and individuals. So how do you get inside communities? How do you, uh, inf there are always influencers or community groups, there are activists, all kinds of people, businesses. How do you use these nodes of community? And that's one thing, uh, these are some of the projects that we've been trying to support, including actually one in Nigeria, which is getting together news organizations with community leaders. It's with a lawyer, with a doctor, with all kinds of folks, and then using them as sort of nodes and then veterans, for example, is another group we've been working with. And how do you then work with them on media literacy, in effect, and then have them sort of share out? Again, it's not, it's not specific information, it's behaviors. We're trying to change behaviors. Do you, as opposed to, oh, I'm gonna believe this, I'm not going to be, believe that, but all of our behaviors need to basically change in how we approach information. What uh, are some other examples of what ICFJ specifically is doing with its disinformation program? So one of the things we're doing is, is, the, is, the, is, is the other side of this, which is building trust. As, as I think probably many of us in the room know, trust in most institutions is down. And journalists and politicians are at the, the top or the bottom, depending on which way you want to count. So one of the things that we're really actively doing is, is seeding efforts to build trust, looking for new experiments, new ways of doing journalism. And so we're supporting different efforts. A couple of examples of those, an Indian American is building a sort of media literacy tool for the non-resident Indian community in the US and abroad, which is huge. And they send a lot of information back to India on WhatsApp. And so again, how do you with them, they're sort of these nodes of influence, how do you, how do you tap them in order to create channels of, of better information? Another thing we're doing is supporting, uh, as I said, La Lara's effort, which is great. So this is an effort called Fact Checkiado, and this is a great example of taking lessons learned from outside the US. Lara's from Argentina, has seen all of this play out in Argentina, and is bringing that expertise here. And she's working with 44 different Spanish language outlets around the US, because Hispanic communities are twice as likely to be sort of victims, if you will, of disinformation than other communities for a host of reasons, including the fact that they use social uh, networks more, the fact that they, um, again, that English, non-English language uh, information is, 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 goes under the radar and is ignored by the, the platforms. So that we think is incredibly important, especially in the run-up to elections, that, that ability, because as we, we've seen, you know, misinformation in different communities in the U.S. has a real, real potential to have a very negative impact. We, we think it, ha it had an impact on the way Florida voted, for example. Uh, the Miami community, for example, there was a lot of disinformation on Spanish language radio. So these are the kinds of things that we're, we're working on, both globally and here in the US. You know, the genie is out of the bottle, bottle, whether it's AI, social media, politicians, governments, you know, as you were saying, Russia, China, Iran um, attacking us, you know, it's out of the bottle, but what can we do? I would approach that again as individuals and as, as citizens community. So as individuals, as I said before, I think I'm safe to say every single person in this room has spread misinformation. We're, if, we're part of, if we ever have gone online or listened to media or shared anything, we have it. Again, not intentionally. So we all need to be better news consumers. Check your sources. It sounds like I'm, you know, eat your spinach, but it actually matters and it makes a difference, as my 18-year-old daughter has told me. So she has, has stopped her. My, you have two sources. So look at what you're doing. Don't share things that you actually haven't read, I think is another thing. And again, I think many of us are guilty of that. 
as 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 a the Rotary Club and as as a as an organization committed to service and committed to community, I think again this is in, this needs to be an issue that is addressed in a nonpartisan way. We all are suffering from disinformation. Again, our ability to be be uh, businesses, to be citizens, to raise our children, and so looking for ways to support media literacy efforts to support media, to support local media in particular, which is the most trusted form of news for most people. So I think we need to approach this both as what is the civic engagement piece and then what is our individual responsibility. I think we should open up to questions, um, folks. Uh, let's, let's, let's hear, let's answer the questions you want to have answered. Stephanie. I watched the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and I thought Roy Wood did a really good job with his monologue. In addition to being funny, he made an important statement about how all news started as a local story. And that really hit with me because I love local news, and more and more we're seeing less of it. So I actually have two questions for you. First of all, what can be done, what is being done to help continue to cultivate and save local news? And also, I'm just curious, were you able to snag a ticket to the dinner, and what was that like? <laughs> I'll answer the first, no, I was not, sadly. But, but uh, a number of our partners were there, and uh, Politico actually put a sign about us on their tables and raised some money for us. So that was better than being there. So I can answer that one first. The, the thing about local news is a very simple answer. Pay for it. News is, <laughs> it's, it's not a commodity. It, it's, if you want it, it's valued, you have to pay for it. One of our, our as, uh, as, as one, so one of the areas we focus on is, is media sustainability, journalism. Not that people are looking necessarily to, 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 to create a profit. Most local news organizations, new ones starting, are not for profits. Or, or if they are for a profit, you know, it's a penny they're looking for to make. So that is, the, I think, the biggest thing that you can do. The other thing is get to know local journalists. We, you know, I, I hear so much people say, oh, the media does this, the media does that. Usually people are really talking about what they've, the shout fest they saw on cable TV. That's not most journalists. That's not most journalism. And so opportunities for journalists to speak to the community, to engage in community activities, I do think is incredibly important because, you know, like, like many, you know, we've become demonized, right? You know, and that, you know, when you dehumanize and demonize, it's not real, they're not real people, they're not really doing their best. And most journalists are really, really doing their best. Other questions? I had one which we can use while if there are any others. So, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for your thoughts there. So, um, you know, I, it, it boils down to value systems in a way, right? So if, you're, if you want to use disinformation as a weapon, um, but at, at the core, if you can say someone's values are first, you know, community and debate is, is even more important than that, they can self-correct, right? But those that truly aren't going to have those values, and I think you touched on it a little bit earlier, but how, how, do we, how do you reconcile those two things and how do you really attack that one where that's their value is disinformation? It's hard, as I said before, people who are so far gone, it's not, it, it, they're not intellectually honest, so you can't have an intellectually honest debate right. of, of differing ideas. And you don't want to get into a position, I, I do think this is where the social media companies have honestly struggled. I mean, in some ways it's not, it's simply a business motive, but in other ways it is they don't want to shut down free speech. And that line between disinformation and free speech, right, is really, really, really hard sometimes. But I think, to your point, you can have that debate. I mean, you want to be able to debate somebody on the merits. And shutting, shutting it down doesn't always work. But, but this is, again, what journalists try to do. What we're trying to do is promote a healthy information ecosystem. So if you want to combat disinformation, you have to have the good stuff. To, to out there to, 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 to battle against it. So to your point about, you know, what can we do to support local news? If you don't have quality information, reliable information, then disinformation will, you know, be, be the loudest voice in the room. So you really have to say, okay, we have to basically combat it, not by necessarily going after it directly, which is also important, but also, you know, responding to it with really quality information on the other side. 
Well, great point. I know you touched on that. I mean, the quality of the institutions at the end of the day can fill that otherwise void or vacuum that disinformation fills. Uh, any other questions here? We'll do uh, right here, and then we can come back over here. So go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say that the, uh, the biggest problem that you face, that we all face as journalists, is everyone, everyone's looking for, an, they want to see the facts, we want to see the facts interpreted the way the way they want to see their facts interpreted. So the whole idea of the fact of what is right-wing news versus left-wing news, you just want news that's accurate. Um, in England, you have a dozen newspapers stretching the entire spectrum uh, of news, and people then gravitate to the news they have. So I think it's, the problem is, I think people have lost faith in, in other countries have lost faith in the media, because oftentimes the media isn't necessarily an independent media. Oftentimes, they're a state-run media. So Journalism gets kind of lumped into a lot of different buckets. Some are propagandists and some are independent. How do you kind of divvy up the world so that there's a better understanding of what an independent free press is? It's a, it's a great question, and you're right. It, it is a huge problem. But again, the internet sort of exacerbated, right? Your brand gets lost. You don't know who you're reading, what you're reading, what you're watching necessarily. I think that this is why I, I personally think and why my organization is supporting a lot of it, efforts to create more transparency around the news process, I think are vital, absolutely vital. People don't understand what goes into making the journalistic sausage, if you will. One of the projects that we've supported is with Vox Media, for example, and they're building what's called a transparency layer. So you know more about the reporter. You know why they reported the story, how they reported the story, because even just deciding what to report, nobody really understands. And I think those kinds of things are really, really vital. I, I remember when I, when I was a working reporter, you know, invariably you get the question, well, what was it really like? And if you have to ask that question, then you did a lousy job telling your story. So I do think that really, that building of trust and transparency needs to be front and center in the journalistic process. Uh, I know, I saw Billy's hand, and I think I saw one other too. So Billy, and then maybe Dennis, did you have your hand up? Okay. I think of our organization, and it's our own individual employees' responsibility to protect corporate assets from phishing scams or, or bad actors or whatever it is. And you mentioned also... Um, and, and when we're told that, we're told of the cost of cybersecurity, for example. And you mentioned the cost of local journalism is valuable and we should pay for it. Do you or has your organization quantified or put a cost on disinformation and, and thought about how to raise the cost that it, that it impacts us and our community in a, in a figure sort of way? That's interesting. My, my next project, clearly. Uh, not, a, not a dollar figure, but there are very specific costs. That's a, it's a really interesting question. I, have, I will have to think about that. But, but where there is a very documented cost is in civic engagement. When you don't have local news, when local, local news goes away, you have fewer people voting. You have fewer people showing up at your local council meeting. You have less civic engagement. That's been well documented. And I think that ultimately has a fundamental cost in our societies. There is a, a gender cost. Women journalists in particular are harassed online at volumes that are just extraordinary much more than, than, than men. And so what you're finding a lot is women moving out of the space. So you have, you know, we want more diversity in media, we want, we want to represent our groups, but if groups feel like this is a dangerous place to be, you're going to see sort of move, moving out from space. I mean, all of these things ultimately will have a financial cost. I mean, Eli Lilly's stock price went down, right? That's a financial cost. So it's, it's hard to... I think it's hard to come up with a single number because, again, this is just in so many facets of our life that we don't even fully see it and realize it. But I think if you, you looked at any aspect of your business or your life, you can find a specific cost. Dennis? How do you see disinformation playing out in the 2024 elections? Uh, my crystal ball. Uh, so it's already being called the AI election. You know, if previous, if previous elections were the Facebook election, you are going to see it playing out writ large. The difference, I think, will be slightly is that people are more aware. All kinds of research and studies, when you ask if people if it's a big, disinformation is a, is a big issue, it's like 75, 80%. I mean, Americans don't agree on anything. <laughs> and so that's a, pretty, that's a pretty big number. So I think the disinformation is going to come from 
every side, domestically, internationally. So I think, I mean, my concern is that people stay home is that people, again, you, you, what you end up with is this skepticism, is like, I don't know what to believe, I don't know who to vote for, I'm just not going to stay home. So I think keeping it in the limelight is incredibly important. Again, I think that's another role for journalists, is waving, the more attention that disinformation gets and the more that we are teaching people to, to think about it, and, but, but not just to you know, throw up their hands and say forget it, but how can we, make people say, hey, think about X, Y, and Z. So I think it's gonna be like nothing else. Again, the generative AI is going to change this, I think, like, like no election. We, we've already seen it starting. Uh, Zach. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Tell me how you think that the topic of transgenderism is either truth or disinformation or misinformation and how it's being portrayed in the American press? <laughs> Easy one, thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I think there is no such thing as the American press. There is, it's not a monolith as we've seen. There are people coming at it from all, all, all walks of life and we increasingly do have polarized media the same way our, our communities and our, our, our people are polarized. I, I think we as a country have an inability to have informed debate about any issue at this point. We are incredibly polarized. So finding out, so being able to report in a way that makes everyone happy has become absolutely impossible. And I think a lot of news organizations are, are struggling with that. The New York Times, if you may or may not know, has had uh, issues from they were attacked for their coverage of trans, transgender issues. It's been, I've actually been listening to a, a podcast about J.K. Rowling, which has been interesting. So it, 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 it's, it's a minefield. I mean, this is, this is the problem where we're in now. It is a minefield. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. And our ability, you know, you can throw up immigration, abortion, I mean, every hot button issue, it, it's, it's the one that's getting the most attention right now but there is no monolithic way to cover it or not to cover it. It's just clearly emblematic of our inability as a country right now to have a, have a cohesive debate about, about a lot of things. I think we have time for one or two more. Margie and Clark, I saw your hand if you, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So I know that you're taking the global view, but there's a lot of businesses in this room that have relations with the media or don't have a relationship with the media, including myself. I've had to learn how to deal with the media. I run two nonprofits and two for-profits. How would you encourage people in this room to engage with the media in a transparent, effective way? Because I find that when we get beyond local, we bounce off it. The, the national's not really interested in local stories. Now, that's a great point. It goes to the fact that the ecosystem is shrinking. There are fewer... Excuse me. There are fewer news organizations. There are fewer large news organizations. So they're getting inundated by things. I do think the local is important. I mean, I wouldn't underestimate that. A lot of national reporters as well are looking. You know, they're 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 looking at local media to 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 communicate stories. There are a lot of. Uh, I would look also for folks that are working in networks. I mean, NPR is a great example. You have a local NPR station here, and most NPR stations are also connecting with NPR headquarters and national news. So I would look for those sort of avenues where your local news organization again outreach to them. But what networks do they have that you can tap into? And. Um so there was a great article I thought it was really interesting. I think Tom Johnson actually posted it on Facebook is how it, I came about it. But it was about the death of the newsroom. And this idea that a physical place where people come together and they have, you know, whether it's trust or competition or, you know, arguments, uh, you know, on the floor, on, on, the, on the, the layer of cigarette butts, apparently, that once existed in those, in those places. But, um, but that those places have gone and a bit of that culture that comes with the journalists wrestling with what is truth, what do people need to hear, what, how, do, how are we fairly representing these concepts, seems to be being substantially altered by this physical, or hybrid rather, world that we've moved into. I was just curious how this 
hybrid world where you don't have a, a, a you know David Rubinger or Maria Supporter walking around building personal relationships with people as they do in this room that they then can go to and ask what's really happening in this sector, what's really happening in this issue. How is that actually impacting the vulnerability of our society um, to fall prey to misinformation, disinformation, and then unintentionally propagating it? It's a great, it's a great question. You know, newsrooms and journalism is no different than other businesses. I think probably everybody in this room has struggled, is struggling with the hybrid model. We have all seen the studies that you have more productivity. If you're, you know, working from home, you have less creativity, all, all of these things. So I don't think journalism is immune to that. The struggles are similar. I do agree you have a couple of, of, of things there that are, you know, maybe unique to journalism. One is mentoring. Newsrooms are not... How shall I put this politely? They're just not organized. They're, it's not, it, 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 is, it is, I mean, I, we try, but it is made up of people who usually basically just weren't cut out for the corporate world, if I may. And there's no, uh, so many organ business organizations have real structured leadership, you know, programs and ways, and, and the news industry still struggles with that. It's like, oh, I'm tired, I don't want to be a reporter anymore, I'll be an editor. You know, it's a bit better than that, but not always much so. So you lose mentorship, which I do think is, is important. So that is something, and again, a lot of newsrooms are struggling with that. And a lot of them are coming back. There is, there is that is changing. I'd say, too, there are flip sides where there are things that might help it. So one thing is collaboration. As news organizations have fewer resources, there's a lot more collaboration happening. And that collaboration by definition is not happening with somebody sitting down down the, uh, the aisle from you, down the cubicle from you. And so as we've learned, or learning to work better in a digital space, it is opening up collaboration. I saw, we saw a lot of that happening in the pandemic. News organizations much more willing to collaborate with each other because those, those boundaries had been broken down. So I think that, that is a positive thing that could potentially be coming out of this. And Clark, I just want to say you're spreading misinformation, man. You know, those cigarette butts went out before the pandemic, uh, <laughs> along with the oyster shells and the chicken bones and the, you know, so. And if I could just add one thing, because I didn't, I didn't tie that to, to misinformation and disinformation, but those collaborations, I think, are incredibly important to, to trying to combat dis and misinformation. It is, it does take a village, and it's not just collaboration with other journalists, but with researchers, with civic organizations, having that ability because everybody's part of this whole information ecosystem. So again, as we are developed the muscles to sort of work with people who are not sitting across from us, I think that's, that's healthy in terms of combating disinformation. Well, uh, Sharon, you have uh, brought wisdom to what is one of the defining issues of our time, disinformation, and you've shown that it's it's complex, but you've given us a path and some ways to think about it. So uh, Sharon, you and the ICJ are just doing an incredible work there. Uh, let's have a round of applause and thank Sharon Mashavi for being with us. Thanks for having me.